Welcome everyone, my name is Donella and I'm a member of the Development and Alumni Relations Office at the University of Otago and it's a very great pleasure to be able to host you all this afternoon at this an inaugural event that we've used um, the Hocken Collections to provide a webinar for you all. Now some of you will already be familiar with the Hocken Collections and understand that they have a range of materials available for public viewing and today we're going to focus on materials from the 1940s through to the 1980s and hope that this might provide a nostalgic journey for you. Today I'm very happy to welcome and I'd like to welcome our, and thank our two presenters, both of whom are librarians at the Hocken Collections. And I'm sure that their expertise and their passion for their subject area will ensure that there is a fascinating presentation for you today. So I'd love to welcome today Amanda Mills, who's been a liaison librarian and curator music and AV at the Hocken Collection since December 2011. She has worked with music and sound collections since 2004 and has recorded research, sorry, different areas of music for academic and general publication, as well as writing for New Zealand Musician Magazine and Audio Culture, the noisy library of New Zealand music. Amanda is currently working towards a Master of Arts in Music. Our second presenter today is Catherine Milburn, who was appointed liaison librarian and curator of ephemera at the Hocken Collections in November 2011. A graduate in Anthropology at the University of Otago and in Library and Information Studies at Victoria University of Wellington. She has worked at the Hocken Collection since 1989. She enjoys helping all kinds of researchers find and use Hocken material. Now, you'll also notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. If you have any questions for Amanda and Catherine, please feel free to type them into the Q&A area and at the end of the presentation, we will um, address those questions and ask them to answer them. If we run out of time, we will answer those questions via email. But once again, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon. And I'd like to thank um, both Amanda and Catherine for their time. And I will now hand over to both um, Amanda and Catherine to take you through their journey of the Hocken Collections. Thank you. Kia ora everyone. Good we're afternoon. Just, we're just going to uh, share our screen. So we've got a PowerPoint presentation for you to look at. Yeah, I hope everyone can see that. Well, kia ora um, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's lovely to, to know that you are out here watching our presentation. Um, I'm Amanda Mills, I'm a liaison librarian here, and we're going to take you through a PowerPoint tour, virtual tour of the Hocken over the next uh, 45 minutes. So um, if you don't know much about the Hocken, uh, we're going to tell you a wee bit first. Uh, but the Hocken is open from Monday to Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, but our pictures and photographs collections are open by appointment only at the moment. So the Hocken is uh, named after Dr. Thomas Morland Hocken. Um, he was born in England in 1836 and trained as a medical doctor. He immigrated to Dunedin in the early 1860s and set up a general practice in Warrow Place right across the road from First Church. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with that area. Um, on the right, you can see his house, Atahapara. Um, he also became the coroner in Dunedin, which um, involves determining the cause of death of people who die suddenly or in suspicious circumstances. Dr. Hocken began collecting all types of material when he arrived here, and he wanted to document the history and development of New Zealand. He also used this material for his own research and compiled the first major bibliography of New Zealand literature. He traveled around the country, collecting all kinds of printed material, as well as art and artifacts. He decided to gift his collection to the people of New Zealand uh, to be managed by the University of Otago. So the Hocken is both a public library that is open to everyone and also part of the University of Otago library system. So the Hocken first opened in 1910 in a wing of the Otago Museum. And if you go down uh, the one-way system going north, uh, you'll still see the Hocken wing on the side of the building. Once material is accepted into our collections, we keep it forever. So our need for physical space um, to keep this material is always increasing, as you can imagine. 
The library moved into most of one tower of what was called the Hocken Building in 1979. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's the building in the uh, middle of the screen. And that building is now called the Richardson Building. In 1989, the archives and photograph sections moved into separate buildings on Lee Street, uh, which is done by the university. And in 1998, both sections of the library came together again in our current building on Anzac Avenue, uh, which was formerly a cheese and uh, butter factory. It was the Otago Cooperative Dairy Factory. So uh, we specialise in material from New Zealand, particularly Otago and Southland, uh, and we also collect material from the Pacific, Antarctica and early Australia. And we have continued to collect following the original collecting by Dr. Hocken. And this um, includes any material relating to, a, to New Zealand or by a New Zealander. And again, focusing on Otago and Southland. So the Hocken is a research library and collects a wide range of material to a greater depth and a range of subject areas. It is reference only, so items can only be used within the library. And the Hocken is also closed stack, so it is only on our library tours that you can see into the stacks where we keep our materials. Now, usually you can search the public catalogues to locate items and request them once you are registered, and then staff retrieve them for you uh, to use in our reading rooms. You can scan or photograph material, but with no flash, uh, for your own private research, unless, of course, there are restrictions in place. Um, we do ask that you comply with copyright though, and we can also supply physical copying, but there is a small chance. So uh, to use the Hocken, uh, you must register as a reader. Um, if you are a staff member or student of the University of Otago or Otago Polytechnic, then um, you've got an ID card, which means that you are registered to use our published collections. And it's books, newspapers, and magazines, maps, and audiovisual material. Um, you can do this by logging on to the University of Otago um, library catalogue. It's called Library Search Ketu, uh, with your institution's username and password. Now, if you use, wish to use our unpublished collections, which are archives and manuscripts, photographs, pictures, and ephemera, then you need to research, uh, sorry, then you need to register to use Hakana, which is our unpublished collections database. Any member of the public can register to use um, any of the collections. And desk staff can provide you with registration form to fill out, uh, but we do need to cite some photo ID. So if you could just please put in a driver's license passport. Um, or something that, that has your photograph on it, that would be, that would be my So because we hold unique heritage material and we wish to keep it for as long as possible, um, we do ask that people please place any bags and laptop sleeves in our lockers. Um, each locker can be locked with a key and you keep hold of that while you're in the library so everything is safe. You are able to bring in um, items like laptops and writing material, but we do ask that pencils are used in the reading room only, and we do provide these as well. Um, also, if you have one, we, we suggest you bring in your university or Polytech ID cards, and of course your Hopkin card. Um, we can't eat and or eat or drink in the reading room, but you are most welcome to make use of our lunchroom in the foyer. There is a fridge and an oven and a microwave uh, oven for use. Um, and there's tea, coffee and Milo and of course water available as well. Now these supplies are paid for through donation and there is a donation box on the wall in the tea room. So just a, a wee overview of the published collections and the unpublished material that we have. So in our published collections, there are a wide range of books, both fiction and non-fiction. And here you can see um, some of our items, for example, a first edition of the Edmunds Cookbook. Uh, we also hold a wide variety of past and current newspapers from the very first newspaper published in Dunedin, the Otago News um, in 1848, through to newspapers published in the Pacific Islands. We only hold the major daily newspapers for Auckland and Wellington and the North Island, but we do hold a wide range of news newspapers published in the South Island for smaller towns and cities, as well as the bigger, bigger centres. We also hold a large number of New Zealand, Pacific and Antarctic related magazines uh, and newsletters. These range from mainstream magazines like the New Zealand Women's Day to academic journals such as Pacific Science. We have a very large map collection that includes um, things like early discovery maps through to modern tourist maps. The collection includes a wide range of map types such as charts that show how deep the harbours are, atlases, <clears throat> topographic 
topographical maps that show features of the landscape and cadastral maps such as the one seen here for Waverley, which is a, um, a suburb in Dunedin. These show how the land has been split into sections and blocks of ownership. And our collection also includes a series of aerial photographs of Dunedin from the late 1940s. Um, I'm always proud of these collections because these are the ones that I, I develop and take care of. Uh, so we collect all formats of recorded music and sound recordings by New Zealand artists or produced in New Zealand. These include over 19,000 recordings um, on record um, and that includes LPs, 45s and 78 RPM discs. Uh, there's also cassette tapes and compact discs. Um, we even have a cylinder uh, or two. Alongside these collections, we hold over three and a half thousand pieces of sheet music. And the oldest uh, on the right is the Whalers of the Deep Deep Sea by De Hugh and St George uh, from around 1857. Uh, we are also starting to collect digital uh, downloads, but these are currently not available to listen to um, as yet. Um, our music collections represent all genres, uh, from classical music and opera to punk, country and western, rock and popular music. Our collection is uh, particularly strong in Dunedin music, especially that of the Dunedin sound. Our sound recordings um, also include New Zealand myths and stories in both English and te reo, as well as recordings of New Zealand literature and sports commentary. And, um, Getting, getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. <laughs> um, I also collect the audiovisual materials. So um, our audiovisual collections include a wide range of formats on VHS video and DVD, as well as Blu-ray discs. Um, a range of genres are also covered from documentaries such as Why Am I, which is a Dunedin study, uh, feature films, for example, Scarfies from 1996, which is a film about Otago University students and their antics, um, and Moana, um, a children's film featuring um, which features a Polynesian story, um, as well as um, uh, myths, um, um, and the film uh, includes New Zealand actors as well. And we also have the English and Te Reo version of that film. Uh, we also collect television series, so um, we, you might be familiar with West Side, uh, which is a historical drama and a very outrageous fortune. So all material must be played uh, on the equipment in our audio vigil area. And these can be set up so that four people um, at once can view or listen at any one time. Uh, we do ask if you did come in and wanted to watch something on video or listen to something on cassette, that you order it uh, 24 hours before you come in, just because of the way it's stored, it needs to acclimatize to room temperature. Okay, so it's Catherine now, and I look after the ephemera collection. Ephemera is a Greek word that means something that lasts for a day. So in, in terms of what we hold here, it is the type of material that most people would use and then dispose of. But we want to collect that kind of material because it's direct evidence of what our society was like at a particular time. So it tells you about the types of technology that we had available, fashions in um, clothing, design, and it's just actually some just and, and not a lot of other libraries collected, and so that's why it is important to collect. And on the screen there, you can see examples of the types of flyers we have. So as you probably are well aware, it's election time, and we've been collecting election material for the whole country since 1966. We also have a whole range of programs. It does include uh, major sporting events, but um, also all kinds of music and theatre programs. We do just basically collect these for Otago and a little bit of Southland, but some things we do collect nationally. So the election ephemera, as well as tourism ephemera, we do collect for the whole country. Um, we also, uh, the collection includes uh, packaging for local firms. So here you can see a German sausages label for a local company, Irvine and Stevenson. They used to be um, located in Dunedin and they made um, jam, as well as obviously tinned meats and What's interesting is this is probably pre-World War I because anything that had the name German in it would have changed uh, to Belgian because of the negative connotations with the war. On the left here, a lot of you will be familiar with this. So these are Golden Kiwi tickets, what we used to have pre-Lotto. And we get groups of high school students coming in and they're always interested to see that the first prize back then was uh, $24,000 which wouldn't even get you a deposit on a house these days but back then that probably paid for a house and a whole lot 
more. And on the far right here, we've got um, an NAC airline ticket. And again, it shows you the changes in our society because these days you can turn up, you don't even have to have a physical ticket. You can just scan something QR code from your phone. You don't have to have that physical ticket. So um, again, evidence of how society changes over time. And uh, the ephemera collection also includes posters, and there's over 23,000 posters at the Hocken. Um, these range in, in subject. Uh, we've got a very strong collection of um, health and safety posters, and here you can see some quite important messages that are still um, of concern today. And in the middle there, another election poster. This one's from the 1970s. It's for the Labour Party, but you can see that they're trying to hark back to the the times when women first got the vote. And on the right here, um, this is a this is not a poster, but it's uh, more like a menu of um, services available at Hendy's Toilet Rooms. And Toilet Room was actually an old name for uh, ladies' hairdressers. So you can see the types of um, service that were available and the prices they cha charged. The problem with a lot of ephemera is it doesn't have dates, but through research with old telephone books that we have in the library and actually just working out that Marcel waving was a form of curling your hair that was very popular in the 1920s and 30s. This is probably the date of this actual item here. So we have a very, very large archives and manuscripts collection at the library. Archives are the records of an organisation and our uh, records include a whole lot of organisations like um, ch local churches. We have um, we have the official repository for the Anglican churches in Otago. We also include a whole lot of uh, local schools and businesses, and of course the university, college of education, a whole lot of sporting and community organisations. Um, places like the Otago Rugby Football Union, Plunkett Society started in Dunedin, so we've got all their records there. Manuscripts are the personal papers of individuals, so it can include things like diaries. And on the top right of the screen here, you can see a journal by William Fox, who was an early surveyor. He traveled out to New Zealand in the 1840s and his uh, journal of his voyage out to New Zealand includes some fabulous little sketches, including the one on the screen, which shows a dog. And we also have the papers of Lady Anna Stout. She was married to Robert Stout, who was a prominent Dunedin lawyer and then became the Premier of New Zealand. She was um, an early suffragist and um, a, was involved in the British suffragist movement and she collected suffragette badges from all around the world. So they're also the type of material we have in the library. Uh, we, so there are over a million photographs in the archives collection because if people donate us their photographs along with their letters and diaries and things, we keep them together in the archives collection. But we've also got over a million photographs separately in our photographs collection. And again, these cover all kinds of topics and um, people and all kinds of um, subjects. And on the and they include uh, photographs from amateur photo photographers as well as um, professional photographer studios. So on the top left there, you can see a portrait of Shona McFarland by Morris Kershaw. You may remember Shona McFarland. She was a panelist on the TV show in the 1970s, Beauty and Beast, and she was also quite a well-known artist. And on the top right, there's a photograph of the octagon um, in the 1870s with a big monument there that's not there anymore. Below that is a photograph from the 1960s of the Balaclava Midgets marching team, which is in colour so uh, people can see the lurid colours that were you know, used for fashion in the 1960s. And on the left there, Dunedin Airport with an NAC aeroplane. So that ticket that we saw previously would have been what you used to board the plane. We also have a very large pictures collection, so over 17,000 works of art. And if you compare that, for example, to the holdings of the Dunedin Public Art Gallery, they've got 13,000. So it is a significant collection. And it includes uh, very early works of art. So on the bottom, we have a work by uh, J.C. Hoyt of showing the pink and white terraces, which disappeared in the Tarawera eruption. So Dr. Hocken was collecting 
works of art like this because they showed what the country looked like. And when he first came to New Zealand, photography was just being started. So this was a way of documenting what, what our country looked like and the changes. And he also collected portraits of um, people who were prominent in history. But over time, our focus of collecting has changed. So we are documenting the history and development of New Zealand art itself. So um, we have a, we are not only collecting um, historic artists, but current artists as well. So on the top left, there is a work by um, Doris Lusk, which shows tobacco fields at, in Nelson. And on the right is a work by W.H. Allen, which shows a baby called David, who was seven months old in September 1973. So the Hocken has its own website. It's actually when, within the main University of Otago Library website, but if you just typed in the word Hocken into Google, it will bring up our website. And you can see in this blue banner on the left, there's a whole lot of links where you can find um, further information as well as staff contacts if you wanted to email us in particular or, or find other curators to, if you've got a specific inquiry, maybe that relates to the MAC collection, it would make more sense to contact Karen or our map librarian. And in the middle there, there's also some links there that you can take, as well as links to our social media accounts, which we'll talk about later. So um, one of the links on the blue banner is to our research guides. We've got over 40 of these. These are all free and available to download from our web page. We do update these every year. And But if you are able to come into the library, then you can pick up paper copies and again, they're free. So we do have a set of genealogical sources guides. So if you're interested in genealogical research and you wanted to know about specific resources that are held at the Hocken, they describe what we have. And then our our main reference guides are split up into sort of subject areas. So there are ones covering all the major wars like World War I, South African War, World War II. We have a lot of people coming to do research on houses and buildings. So there's a guide relating to that. If you're interested in agriculture, Antarctic, science, health sciences, law, there's guides relating to those. And on the right there, we also have a series of Maori uh, research guides. So there's one specifically on kaitahu sources, but also how to do whakapapa research. Now, both our catalogues are available online, so you are able to search them from anywhere without having to be uh, registered as a library user. But if you do ever want to come in and use the collections, as Amanda said before, you do have to register as a reader. So we are gradually digitising material and making it sometimes available through these catalogues. This particular catalogue here is what you would use to search for our published collections, so our books, newspapers, magazines, maps and audiovisual material, but you do have to be aware that it also includes the holdings of the main university library system. But when you find something, you just need to check that it's got a hock and holding to be able to Harkana is the name of our other catalogue, so that's where you look for any other kind of material. So that's pictures, photographs, archives and manuscripts, and we've just started adding ephemera. So there's not a lot on there at the moment, ephemera-wise. So if you can't find anything on our catalogues, it does always pay to ask staff because not everything is actually listed on the catalogues, or you, it may be the way that you're searching. So staff are always willing to help you find material yourself. Um, we also have a separate website called Hock and Snapshop where we have made available digi digitised photographs. There's about 30,000 photographs. So as we, I said earlier, there's 2 million photographs in the library altogether. So this is a very small portion and we are not adding to this particular website, but there are um, images you can search. You can search under a particular term or you can browse using um, the subjects on the on the right on the screen and you are able to download low-res images there and we have another website called Our Heritage where you are able to find some digitized paintings a few pieces of ephemera sheet music from World War One as well as some of our archives collection too and as I said before we do have a social media presence so we do have our own Facebook page, Twitter account, a Hocken blog, 
page and a YouTube channel. So um, if any of you are exploring the web, then please feel free to log on to any of those and locate our materials. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we've selected a few items that you might um, find of interest. And so we're just going to run through those. So as this is an alumni event, we um, thought that you would be interested in some things relating to the university from days gone by. And we do have a fantastic collection of photographs that are available to view through our catalog Harkener that were taken in 1949 by a photographer in the Prime Minister's department. So as you can see, they're very good quality photographs. Um, and this one shows a chat between lectures at the University of Otago Quadrangle, and um, obviously students back then were a lot better dressed than they are now, and they've even got nice little leather briefcases too. And another photograph in that series shows the interior of St Margaret's College Common Room, obviously a women's college, and again another fascinating glimpse into the life of students back in 1949. So there's a wide range of uh, University of Otago related ma uh, material in the collections and that includes periodicals and on the right you'll see the Otago University uh, capping book. So capping is a huge part of university culture and we've documented it in different collections. Um, here you see a recording on the left of uh, the 1960 capping concert and um, as I said the 1948 capping book. We also have photographs, publications, archives and other documents and some other AV um, recordings uh, from the 1980s of um, Epping events. So on the left here you can see um, an, a, um, it's not really a poster, it's kind of a card that was used to promote a 1958 production by the Otago University Dramatic Society and um, this Scan here doesn't really show it in its full glory because the um, painting, the, the coloured lettering is actually kind of a lot brighter and almost fluoro um, in appearance. And it's just um, an example of the type of material we have relating to a whole lot of clubs and societies of the university. And on the right here, you can see um, a photograph of the from the university. Cricket Club Senior 11 in 1968 and 69, and this material is in our archives collection. So again, we have records for a whole lot of different clubs, but we also have gaps. So if any of you have your own records that you'd like to donate to the library, we'd be most interested in that kind of material. So just feel free to contact us about that. And then in our art collection, we also have some beautiful drawings, architectural drawings, um, this is one by Edmund Anscombe, who was an architect, and he obviously designed this archway building, which features Alan Hall on the on the right there, and behind it was Marimar Hall. And obviously, it's not a literal uh, depiction there, because as you may all remember, this building's actually on a slope, so this is showing it flat. So um, on our YouTube channel, uh, there's about 50 short videos and you can find it on YouTube um, if you go to the website and just type in Hocking Collections in the box and it will bring up that channel. So this film um, is VJ Day Celebrations in Dunedin on the 15th of August 1945, marking the end of World War II. And the film is from the collection of Dunedin amateur filmmaker William Hood Davidson, um, uh, who passed away in 1979. Um, and we, all, we have to thank um, Morris Hayward for digitising this film and um, Morris is part of the Cine Club in Dunedin and he does amazing stuff digitising local film um, for us and for other institutions as well. And this is footage shot around Queenstown and Lake Wakatipu in 1951 or 1952. Uh, so the film shows the steam as the Ben Lomond and the Unslaw. Also, Queenstown Gardens, uh, streets and buildings, bowling and views from them are from a motorboat, um, iCards Hotel and the Karawao Falls Dam. And it's digitised from uh, 8mm film and the George Thorne Collection. And again, thank you to Morris Hayward, who did such a wonderful job of digitising. So in the ephemera collection, we've got all kinds of advertising for local um, firms and companies. And on the left here, you can see um, a fabulous advertisement for stockings and again no date possibly 
early 1950s, I would say, from the dress on, that she's wearing. Um, for it was a local department store, Arthur Barnett, some of you may recall that, which it's now been changed to H and J Smith, and again about to change again because that firm has is closing the Dunedin store. And on the right there, we've got a fabulous advertisement for 1960s Triumph Herald, and this is from a brochure, and someone has helpfully handwritten the price at that time of 895 pounds, a bargain. And then this is a great sheet of um, little um, coloured advertising cards for, that was part of a competition called the Whopper Swapper. So each of these sheets was delivered to households in Dunedin. And the aim was that people would cut up each square. They would decide they would only collect one or two of them. And then you would swap them with other people who were obviously collecting other ones. And then you would submit how many um, cards you had collected to the competition runners. And you can see there was quite a great prize of um, 150 pounds for the open section. And for children, it was a lesser prize of 25 pounds. But what's great for, for researchers today is that um, some of these firms are still going, but it also shows um, fashions and the, actually also the longevity of brand. So you've got tiger tea there and you can see it's a packet of tea. So that shows to people today that you made tea in a teapot, there's not tea bags. And it's also showing you all kinds of other um, great things like Rolo, caramel chocolates, there's Lawrence's bread, there's cars, and also how um, the use of language has changed because there's the use of gay detergent, which wouldn't get these days. Also in the ephemera collection, we've got a fantastic collection of knitting patterns, probably one of the best collections within a New Zealand institution. We've got over 3,000 of those, and they date from the 1940s onwards. Um, from the 1950s and 60s, you start to see um, local photographers and models being used, and obviously taken in local locations. So this, um, cardigan with a with a great useful pocket in it which can fit two fingers on this lady um, has actually been photographed in front of um, the parliament buildings in Wellington and on the right here we've got um, a, a pattern featuring a local uh, Miss Otago contestant in 1960 she was one of the semi-finalists Lynn Young and this uh, was pattern was photographed in the grounds of Glen Fallock and with a rather splendid peacock. And the other thing that's interesting to note is that they produced um, patterns for what they called oversized um, people which, who had a 40 inch or 44 inch bust. And sadly, what they used to do is for the oversized patterns, they usually used older models. So again, we can see um, fashions and trends in society at that time using resources like this. So we've got um, some very interesting map formats in Hawkins collections, including this 256 piece jigsaw map, and it was created in the early 1940s. The map is called a puzzle for Europe, and the pieces of each European country that were invaded by Germany uh, during World War II are in the shape of a swastika. The jigsaw is accompanied also by a map of Europe. We have this item um, as many entertainment uh, who manufactured the jigsaw were, um, were based locally. And we have two copies. The first, donated by, by Mr. E.W. Jefferis in 1989, was missing two pieces, but a second copy was found at the Regent Anything But Book Sale a few years ago, fully intact. So we picked up another copy to have a, um, a fully working function. So in our maps collection, we've got all different kinds of maps and includes these great farm location maps. So these were produced in the 1960s right through to the 90s and they were often done as fundraising projects for organisations like the JCs. And here you can see one that's covering South Otago. This one was published in 1979. And what's great for people maybe doing their family history is it shows where a particular person's farm was located in the area. So, so Something that might have been used for the local farmers is now of use for genealogical research today.
Um, as I said before, we've got millions of photographs in our collection and they are great for showing what the Dunedin used to look like. This is a photograph from 1967 showing the lower octagon where there was the Oban Hotel. This building still stands and now it's um, a bar and cafe called uh, Bystanders. And I also just noticed before in the top um, of the photograph, you can see the wires for the trolley buses that were still working there. And on the left there, you can see a firm called Matheson and Robert. So they were a plant and nursery. Um, so op in the lower octagon and our ephemera collection includes some fabulous posters for that particular firm. Here you can see a photograph of Dunedin Railway Station in the 1930s. This material was gifted to the Wairoa Museum and then transferred to the Hocken. Um, Again, it shows changes, and obviously not to the building because that's still pretty much the same, but it shows how the foreground has changed. This is all now all planted out in a rather lovely little garden, but it's also great to see in the back, the foreground of the station, um, cars of that time. And then we've got this great photograph from the 1955 to 61. It was taken by photographer George Chance showing what um, agricultural work was being done in um, Queenstown. And then this is a fabulous piece of work from the same area. So this was a painting by uh, Nicholas Chevalier. So he came over to New Zealand in the 1860s. He was commissioned by the Otago Provincial Government and he was paid 200 pounds to travel around Otago and paint beautiful scenery to try and attract settlers over here. Um, he also did similar kind of work for the Canterbury Provincial Council. So he went around the Mount Cook region visiting all the major lakes and this is one of his fabulous pieces of work. And then we also have this great scene by um, a local artist, Ralph. He was um, part of the Miller family who ran Miller Studios and this work is showing a Dunedin scene from circa 1949 um, and he was mostly self-taught artist but he did have some lessons from Dunedin artists A.H. O'Keefe and Kathleen Salmond and during the war he was a member of the army band and was posted to Fiji and New Caledonia and, we do, and there are a lot of works not necessarily in our library but that he created showing army life at that time but obviously back in Dunedin he tried to show what Dunedin was like back then. And then we also have some fabulous sort of art in our posters collection. So the railway studio was um, an artist studio that was run by the railways from 1920 to 1987. And obviously they did a lot of work promoting railways and tourist destinations, but they also did work for other government departments. So here you can see a transport department poster. This is actually one of my favorite posters in the collection. Um, getting people to slow down in, in winter traffic with the rain and on the right here um, a, a poster trying to stop people from spitting on the ground because it's disgusting and dangerous and done for the Department of Health. So there are, this is one of many um, health and, great health and safety posters that we have that were done by the studio. So in our sheet music collection, we have very, very early pieces of New Zealand sheet music. Um, and this is the very first edition of God Defy New Zealand. And this is the English edition uh, from a, around 1876. Um, the first New Zealand edition came about a couple of years later. And it came about uh, due to discontent between uh, the authors. Um, I think it's Thomas Bracken on the cover of, of this one. Uh, but John Woods was not particularly impressed that he was left off the first edition. So um, a second edition was printed with them both off it, uh, both on cover. And uh, Māori text of God for New Zealand um, was available in the second edition as well. There are only five copies left in existence of the first English edition. Um, it's very, very rare. Um, and the Hocken is really lucky to have two. Um, and they were donated to us by the sisters at, the, at St Dominic's Priory in Dunedin. And um, Dunedin is possibly, the Hocken, sorry, is possibly the only collection to hold copies of this first edition that I'm aware of. Um, I'm, I have not heard of any other institution holding uh, these copies, but um, that, Always change. Um, we also have a lot, 
a number of amazing periodicals um, in the Hocken. And one of my favourites is Playdate. So it was one of the film, music and popular culture magazines from the 1960s to the early 1970s. And many famous names and faces of the time were featured in the magazine. And um, it did often focus on local New Zealand musicians and actors and popular culture figures, especially later in the magazine's run. Um, we've also been extremely lucky um, to acquire collections of local firms. So when Cadbury's closed a few years ago, the Hocken was fortunate to acquire a number of amazing things from them, including posters, chocolate boxes, and packaging, and the, as well as the company records. Now this short reel of Cadbury advertisements from the late 1960s or early 1970s is part of the company records and would have likely been used on either television advertising or in advertisements at the movies. It was, it was recorded in Great Britain, uh, but used to advertise products in countries that so we're just going to play you um, a mutual public clip. So um, I hope you enjoy this. Nick. Oh, sorry. This man is here to sing the praises of Cadbury's fudge. The praises of the praises of Cadbury's fudge. The praises of Cadbury's fudge. Cadbury's fudge, which is delicious fudge, just like Mum used to make. Only Cadbury's have covered it with creamy milk chocolate. The praises of Cadbury's fudge. Fudge. Cadbury's fudge. By Cadbury's, it's good. Continuing on with uh, the music theme, um, we have a huge collection of Māori and Pacific music at the Hokan, um, and it's got a strong presence in our AV collections, and recordings reflect both traditional and popular music styles. Um, this Wolf, uh, Bill Wolfgram recording on the left South Sea rhythm dates to 1956 and is considered New Zealand's first pop album, while the album on the right, uh, Māori Songs of New Zealand, was issued um, on Folkways Records, and that's part of the Smithsonian label in 1952 and also features traditional songs and song styles and um, if you got um, if you can see right up in the corner um, you might be able to see the owner's name this uh, the original owner was Professor Hargreaves who was a geography professor um, and he lived in New York for a time and he was a major supporter of the Hawkins collections some of these may be very familiar to you these are broadcast to school teachers and pupils music books from the 1960s uh, now, the box included notated melodies and words so students could play or sing along with the casts. In fact, some of you may have had some of those broadcasts um, in, your, um, in your school days. Uh, the teachers' books had full of piano or guitar scores so they could um, give um, fuller instrumentation for any performance. And some of the books, like these ones, were really beautifully illustrated. Um, and these illustrations are by the artist Evelyn Clouston. We don't just collect music, um, as I said earlier, we collect all sorts of sound recordings, including children's stories and fairy tales, myths, literature, including poetry and prose writing, interviews and broadcasts. Um, and we will have also have a small collection of sports broadcasts and racing calls. And this is a favourite, this is Cinderella, uh, published by the Children's Record Guild of New Zealand in the late 60s. And Dunedin music collections are, of course, of significant importance to us. So um, on the left, you've got um, the MC6 and Joe Brown. He was a figure who, he ran dances in Dunedin during the um, early to mid 1960s. And the MC6 were one of his dance bands who played at, at these um, dances. This 45 RPM is a recording from, uh, from them at the time. Um, in the center, you have Luther. Now Luther were one of the major bands from Dunedin 
in the early 1970s and they were a sort of super group that formed from three bands that were finalists in the 1969 South Island Battle of Bands. And the second album pictured here is uh, probably the most popular recording. And on the end, um, on the right, we have a poster advertising the Chills Gold Drum single. The Chills are still one of the most popular bands from the 1980s, didn't even sound scene. Uh, the band is still performing and recording today. And our collections of their material are wide and, and include posters and ephemera, as well as recordings and photographs. And just continue on, on with Dunedin music, um, local 1960s band Titans in the middle with their lovely matching suits were one of Dunedin's top bands in the 1960s and came second in the 1968 New Zealand Battle of the Bands. They often played with the Avengers on the right um, when that band were touring. And the band on the left, the Catlins River Boys, were big names in South Otago and they uh, performed very, um, on a very early uh, TV show. Um, and it was, a, it was a big thing. Apparently half of Oaka were um, in front of the television that night watching. Um, all the Titans and the Avengers played pop rock in the style of the groups of the day. The Catlins River Boys played country music with some Christian songs included. And it's noted that um, their sound at times is similar to New Zealand's own Peter Poser. Um, now, the Titans didn't ever release anything, but we have a collection of their material and it included a couple of tracks. So um, we have a cover of this, um, we have them. Um, doing a uh, Van Morrison song, Gloria, and we've just got a wee snippet of it to play for you just so that you can, you can see. She made you feel so good, though. How much does she make you feel out? And the name is Jean. Yeah. Oh. Ah. Ah. Yeah. Okay, so going back to our archives collection, it does include a whole range of um, papers and this is a collection of papers relating to Charles Mackey Beck who served during the war, World War I um, and he was the um, in command of the Field Ambulance and Medical Corps in Egypt, Gallipoli and the Western Front and his papers include these um, photograph albums as well as a notes book there and diaries and he actually advanced to the top medical post in the New Zealand Expe Expeditionary Force before he finished there. And we've also apparently got one of the best collections of sporting archives in the collection and it does include this um, great scrapbook which or album which includes newspaper clippings as well as photographs and ephemera from a tour by a Maori rugby team in 1926 and 27 that traveled overseas and in the top left corner there, you can see them doing the haka there. Okay, hey, so um, if you are in town, um, in Dunedin, and you would like to see more, uh, public tours um, are available on Thursday mornings at 11 o'clock. Uh, you can just come in and ask at reception and you'll be taken on a tour. And we can also arrange tours for groups, so please do contact us. Um, both our emails are there and our phone number as well. So we'll just leave that That's, um, slide up for a couple. Seconds. And public tours are available all year round for individuals or groups of less than 10. And um, we love donations. And if you can help us with any of our collections, we are always eternally grateful. Uh, we are always keen to augment our collections of New Zealand, Antarctic and Pacific related and published and unpublished material. And any donations are very gratefully accepted and please contact us for further information. It is a guide on giving archives and manuscripts which is available on our website. Thank you, Amanda and Catherine. What a fabulous tour through the Hocken, and I'm sure that uh, you could have gone on for so much longer. I know you had me bopping in my seat to some of the music, and it was wonderful to point to the screen and um, take a wee trip down memory lane, and I'm sure many of our other um, participants felt the same. We have a couple of questions that have come in that I'd like you to see if you could answer. So one question um, is, in the ephemera collections, have you noticed any trends in the materials that have repeated themselves in different decades? Um, yes, so I mean there is obviously still printed ephemera, so that's continued, um, but there are 
there is a trend for more things to become digital as well. So obviously lockdown was a big impact on businesses. So you may have noticed during that time that New World decided to stop creating their own mailers. So they only do them online now. So um, you do get things disappearing because of different technology, but obviously people still produce physical items because not everyone has access to the internet. And you know, you can um, include different things in physical items, but but at the same time, things do still, still, um, still have to be represented. So we've got a great collection of um, the types of sheets that are produced in funerals, for funerals or for people that died. And so, you can see that sort of coming into being in the 50s, 60s, and they're very plain. And then over time, you can see with um, computer technology, people start personalizing things a lot more. Um, so that that's something that's still there because people, well, obviously COVID has changed that as well, that not everyone's able to attend. Um, a funeral in person, but for those that are, they are still given a sheet. So that's something that's still there, but you can see over time how that has changed. Thank you. And the other question that we've got from the same um, same participant, Stephanie, um, she also asks, do you both have a favourite item in the collection, which I'm sure is a difficult question to um, answer. I know you mentioned one of the um, traffic posters, um, the winter driving one being one of your favourites, but is there anything else that you always love to pull out and have a look at? Or um, You're right, it is one of the hardest questions. Um, I, I can't pick a favourite in the music collection. I love it all. Um, yeah, I, I just can't pick a favourite, but um, things that do stand out are, say, things that um, I remember from, uh, I remember loving for a long time and maybe I haven't seen for a while and it's it's all wonderful, but actually some of my favourite other things um, are in the ephemera collection. Uh, there's some amazing posters which are my favourites. Um, and Catherine got a Toy World uh, catalogue from the 1980s um, a couple of years ago. And it was one I remembered very fondly from when I was a child in the 1980s. And as soon as I saw that Toy World catalogue, I was back to being a kid. I was back to being eight or 10 years old. And um, it, yeah, that's one of my favorite things. Yeah, and I think that's one of the great things about having physical items, like things can be digitized and you can see them online, but nothing replaces being able to see the physical item and to be able to touch it because that that brings it that makes it more real and and so like for example the golden kiwi tickets that I showed before you can read about them in a book but when you actually see them in person it, that kind of tactile experience relays a whole lot of things that you don't always pick up on like it shows you like the feel of the paper, you can see that it's been torn off a pad and all that kind of thing. So nothing replaces seeing the physical items. And again, like Amanda, it's really hard to pick something um, and say, that's my favorite. I have different things I like to show people on tours. So for example, and um, we got a great set of um, posters from Cadbury's and they included some fabulous cookie bear posters from the 1970s, which again featured the fluoro paint. So there, a great thing for me because like I was a member of the Cookie Bear Club in the 70s so there's things like that but also um, the great packaging that we have we've got a fabulous we've got lots of fabulous chocolate boxes and other kinds of packaging um, and even things like junk mail and you might think why do you keep junk mail well if you think about it it tells you at a particular time what kind of products we were selling how we sold them the technology that made them so showing people that because they you know it shows that even the most lowly kind of thing that's in our society today will have significant research value years from now. So that's one of the great things about a collection like mine. I would have to say the whole collection is my favorite. And I think from both your answers, you have um, inspired many of our participants to want to come and actually have a look and have that real experience. Oops. Uh oh. 
mm. those things in, in, um, in reality. Um, I have another question here. Can you things in, in many and different um, formats? What particular things do you have to take note of? Sorry, didn't quite catch that question. Can you just repeat it? Sorry, what, what sorts of special techniques or things do you have to do to keep the collections safe? So in terms of preserving paper quality or preserving um, artworks, I'm sure there's a lot of um, special things that you need to be aware of. Yeah, so um, obviously having it in our stacks is one of the major things. So um, our stacks are climate control, so they're kept at about 18 degrees and a relative humidity of 50%. So obviously most of our works are, are made from printed paper. So that's kind of the optimal conditions for paper. So it's not too damp where mould would grow. It's not too dry where paper would become brittle. And also we, um, for, for published material and things like that, we have special packaging. So it's acid free. So again, it's not going to help things deteriorate. Um, and we try and and get things measured up especially so that the packaging fits snugly and will wrap things in acid-free paper. We also, um, again, it depends where it's come from because sometimes people might have kept things like in a damp basement where it's already mouldy. So sometimes that kind of, that has to be treated before we would put it in our stacks next to other material. And we don't have a conservator on site, but we can call on um, a local conservator to help us do that kind of um, preservation. And we have special cabinets and um, folders and boxes um, to keep material in. So we're always aiming to um, improve the conditions that um, we collect material in, um, you know, with new technology as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about that? Um, music's a little different. Uh, a lot of music formats, um, for example, records are very stable. Um, the only thing you have to be careful about, especially with the older ones, is not to drop them because, especially with 78s, they will shatter. Um, that's, it's just the nature of the way they're made. But LPs and 45s, if you drop them most of the time, they, they're okay. Um, it's more put, if you put them in sunlight or any warm um, environment, they could um, sort of warp or melt. Um, the, best, the biggest thing for things like VHS tapes and cassette tapes is keeping them in cooler temperatures. So they are in their own uh, room along with um, uh, glass plate negatives and um, some film that we have. So they're in a 12 degree vault, um, so they're kept cooler. And that's why if people want to listen to um, cassette tapes or watch VHS tapes, they have to give us 24 hours, knowledge, um, 24 hours um, grace be able to get the item out and acclimatize it. Because if you put a cold tape into a room temperature machine, um, something's either going to go wrong with the item or the machine, and we can't have either of that happening. Um, yeah, so um, it really does come down to how, how you keep it and how you take care of it. Thank you, and it's really good for us to hear from both of you to know that this um, precious collection is being so well looked after and, and carefully preserved for um, future generations, which is fantastic. Well, I see that we've um, come to our 2.58, so we're coming close to the end of our um, session and there are no more questions. Um, I'd just like to remind all the participants, if you do think of any questions um, after we finish, please feel free to either um, email us back at the University of Otago where you received your invitation or to Amanda and Catherine directly at the email addresses they showed you. Um, but once again, we'd like to um, thank both Amanda and Catherine for the fascinating tour through the Hopkins collections and hope that it has inspired some of you to maybe make a personalised visit to the collections or even to maybe have a little bit of a look through some of the things that you've had, you have in your own house that you think might be of interest for others to um, see and view and make a donation to um, the Hocken collections of some of that material that you may no longer want yourselves. But thank you all of you for taking the time to come and um, spend an hour with us. Um, our sincere thanks to the Hocken collections and Amanda and Catherine. And we wish that you all have a very lovely day, rest of the day, and maybe we'll see you again in the future. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.